yeah, welcome you all to this awesome discussion that we have for us tonight on the question, how are we saved? Um, this is a joint effort from the uh, from Dewis and the GCU. Um, so it's really good to be doing another one of these. We, we love the last one so much and a bit of a throw, well, not even a throwaway comment, but just a passing comment from you guys and thought, oh, well, let's do it again. And so, um, yeah, really appreciate both of our speakers, Sam Green um, and Abdullah Hamini for for coming and for, um, yeah, presenting their, their different perspectives for us tonight. Um, we're really looking forward to it. Um, I just want to say from the get-go um, that we... Uh, yeah, that we're, we're here to have a discussion on this question from different perspectives um, that can bring up different things and um, that might, um, yeah, there, there'll be some good discussion, um, but we want to make sure that it's respectful um, and that we're, we're all appreciating that, um, yeah, we, we have different views and we are here to discuss them, not to just be at each other and arguing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's just, if you are um, here as a participant or here to watch, then you're welcome to, to make comments in the chat. Um, but don't ask questions in the chat for the speakers. We've got an actual, uh, it's a Padlet uh, thingy majingy website that someone's going to chuck in the chat now. If you have questions for the speakers, there will be a QA and a section in the talk. Um, and we will be yeah, asking both the speakers some questions that you have that might come up through the night. So please use that because it's just too hard to keep track of everything in the chat itself. Um, so any questions that you have, any things that come up, chuck them in this Padlet. They are anonymous. And so you can ask them, uh, yeah, without worrying about um, maybe being called out. But if you want it to not be anonymous, feel free to chuck your name in there. So then the, um, yeah, whoever the question is directed for can address you um, if you want that. If not, completely anonymous. So um, yeah, that is a great way to, um, yeah, a great way to be able to interact and um, yeah, to, to get your questions out there. Um, yeah, so you can talk in the chat, but just, don't ask questions for the speakers there because they won't be answered. Um, use the Padlet for that. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to a great night tonight. Um, there'll be some awesome discussion and perspectives. Um, there's going to be five sections tonight. Uh, there'll be an introduction, uh, a reply to the presentation. Uh, then there'll be a cross-examination. Uh, then finally, we'll move into a Q&A section that I talked about earlier um, before finishing with the concluding statements. Um, and so, yeah, there's going to be time restraints on each of these segments, and I will remind you guys and the speakers for this. Um, we've actually got a uh, timer in the uh, like as part in the Zoom thing this time, um, and so you can look at that and see how long they have. Uh, the speakers know this, but I'll let for your guys' benefit. Um, if they go over time in any of their segments, that time is then deducted from their next segment that they have. So they'll have less time to answer maybe the cross-examination or the um, concluding statement. And so um, both the speakers will be trying to keep within that time constraint so that they have a good amount of time to address each section. Um, eventually, if they have, uh, if they continue to go over time, then they will just have a shorter concluding statement. Um, so the, the, there'll be a, a small ding that the timer will set off at the end of their time. Um, and then I will verbally um, interject after a minute or so over that just to let them know where they are, um, yeah, where they're at with the time. Um, but they can, um, yeah, you feel free to, for, to continue just wrapping up your, your statements and your comments for whatever you're saying. Um, but to, yeah, thank you for coming. Look forward to a good night. And without any further ado, we will get into it. Um, so uh, the first speaker who will who will be presenting is Sam Green. Um, and I would love to ask you, Sam, some warm up questions so that we can get to know you a little bit more. Um, so, can I start by asking, what is your favorite children's book or movie? Um, favorite movie is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. That's a good one. It's a classic. Um, great. And if there is one thing in your life that you would love to accomplish during your lifetime, what would it be? Oh. If you can only pick one. Um, oh, that's a hard one. Mm. I, I enjoy learning languages. So I think to be fluent in another language would be excellent. Yeah. Do you have a particular language? Um, not, not particularly. Um, you know, maybe Arabic would be good to learn fluently. Cool. Yeah, great. Well, um, yeah, good luck tonight, Sam. Um, 
I will throw it over to you um, and yeah, take it away. Okay. Okay, I will start. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. And it's great to be with you today as we look at this important subject of how are we saved? And uh, thanks Abdullah for being part of this and for everyone else for being interested. Um, what I want to do today is to, to uh, explain how I understand the Islamic view of salvation. And I'd appreciate Abdullah sort of coming back and correcting that. And then I'll put forward the Christian one so um, I'm going to be looking at salvation in Islam, salvation in Christianity, and then I'll be putting forward why I think you should accept the Christian position. So here we go. And as I said, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but this is how I read the, the Islamic view of salvation. Um, in the Islamic view of salvation is that you need to earn Allah's mercy. So God has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds, they will have forgiveness and a great reward then those whose scales are heavy with good deeds, they will be successful. And those whose scales are light are those who lose their souls in hell abiding. And so it seems that you need to have correct belief and to do good deeds to earn Allah's mercy. Now in practice though, this works itself out in three different paths. The first path are those people who go straight to paradise. And this is brought up a few times in the Quran. Um, if you are killed or die in God's way, Pardon and mercy from Allah are better than what they collect. If you die or are killed, you'll be gathered up to God. And this is speaking about the, the martyrs who fight for Islam. Uh, narrated Jabir bin Abdullah, on the day of the Battle of Uhud, a man came to the prophet and said, can you tell me where I will be if I should get martyred? The prophet replied, in paradise. The man threw away some dates he was carrying in his hand and fought till he was martyred. So um, now most Muslims don't, most Muslims take a different path. They earn Allah's mercy through the religious rituals of Islam, the five pillars, which are the confession of faith, the fasting, pilgrimage, prayers, giving of money to Islamic causes. When they die, they don't go straight to paradise. They go to the grave first and then hopefully paradise later. Uh, the messenger of Allah, Muhammad said, indeed the grave is the first stage of the stages of the hereafter. So if one is saved from it, then what comes after it is easier than it. And if one is not saved from it, then what comes after it is worse than it. Now, um, for time, I'm not going to go through these, but there's all these hadiths which then explain what can happen to you in your, when you're in the grave. So this is where somebody can go on hajj on your behalf and it's credited to you. Um, other people may bear your sins. Um, so the Quran talks about if you've led someone astray, you will bear their sins on judgment day. Uh, righteous people can intercede for you. Um, and then, of course, th there's these hadiths about the 70,000. And um, I'll, I'll read this one. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the prophet once came out to us and said, I was told, look this way, look uh, and, and that way. So I saw a big crowd covering the horizon. Then it was said to me, these are your followers, and among them are 70,000 who will enter paradise without being asked for their accounts. So there's 70,000 who are going to have a special mercy from God in that they won't face judgment. The final um, path is for the non-practicing Muslim. They go to the grave, then they go to hell, and then if they've had correct belief, they go to paradise. So whoever said None has the right to be worshipped, but Allah and has in his heart good faith equal to the weight of a barley grain will be taken out of hell. And so it seems to me that this is the Islamic understanding that there are these different paths, different ways of earning Allah's mercy. And you can see them there. Um, and I guess the question I have for our Muslim friends is, uh, which path do you think you're on if, if that's what you follow? Um, I want to look at the, the way of Christianity now, uh, salvation in Christianity. In Christianity, there's only one way. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So the Christian way of being saved is just Jesus and what he has done for us. Now, why is it that 
there's the only one way through Jesus. Well, I'll just give a bit of an overview here of what the Bible teaches. Um, firstly, God created us to bring him glory and honor. But we have sinned against God and we fail to do this. So we fail to bring God glory and honor. We fail to obey him. Um, we fail to keep God's laws. And there is nothing we can do to save ourselves. We don't give God glory. And uh, we're gonna, gonna face God's judgment. He made us to bring him glory and obey and, and, and live for him and give him honor. We don't do that. God's law that we break shows that we don't do that. And so we've, our future is judgment, judgment before God. We can't be good enough and our future is, is judgment. Now, um, into this world, God has said that he, he's going to come. We'll look at those prophecies in a minute. But God has come to do what we have failed to do. And he's done it through the man, Jesus. And so Jesus lived the perfect human obedient life. He glorified God perfectly. He lived the life that we should live. Um, he, uh, Jesus died as our representative, taking the punishment we deserve. And Jesus was raised because his work was successful. He brings the resurrection life. And uh, Jesus, like Adam, did these things for us and for the glory of God. He's, he's our representative doing what we have failed to do. And so uh, as a Christian, this is what I would ask everyone to, to put their faith in. That this is the Christian position. And um, I think we should uh, be encouraging people to put their faith in it. Now, why accept the Christian position? I want to look at two particular reasons. One is it's the message of all of the prophets, not just one prophet. And secondly, if I have time, there's no one like Jesus. So let's get straight into this. Um, what is the Bible? The Bible is not one book, but a collection of many books from many prophets over about a 1500 year period. It has the law of Moses, the books of the prophets, the Psalms, the books of the gospel, and uh, these books build on each other and they're meant to be read together and together they give us God's complete message uh, from beginning to end. Now, what we see here is that we have turned away from God. We're not giving God the glory we should. We're under his judgment. We fail to keep his law and God promises that he's going to come and do something. So let's look at some of these verses. Uh, these are from prophets hundreds of years before Jesus. So this is uh, the prophet Isaiah. It says, The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm worked salvation for him. His own righteousness sustained him. Now, this is talking about what God's going to do in the future. And it, it's saying that God looks around. He looks at humanity. And there's no one in humanity who can do what's required. So what's going to happen? God's going to do it himself. We see this again in Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. And so again, it's this promise that who's going to put things right? Well, God's going to put things right. And he's the one who's going to come and do it. We, we can't do it. God's going to come and do it. God's going to actually come and do something to save us. Now, we read elsewhere in uh, Ezekiel, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. Then I will make atonement for you for all you have done. Now, the word atonement is this idea of sacrifice. It's a, a payment of a, a sacrifice to pay for our sins so that we can come into God's presence. And here it is, God saying, uh, you know, in the past, you made it sacrifices of atonement, but I'm going to come and bring the sacrifice of atonement. And then just a, a reference from Psalms, uh, he, that is God himself, will redeem Israel from all their sins. <clears throat> so this is what I would say is my, my first point here, that why should you believe the Christian position? Well, the gospel is the fulfillment of what the prophet said beforehand. They said that God was going to come and do what we failed to do. God was going to come and bring atonement for our sins, that God was going to be the one who would come and save us. And this is exactly the message of the gospel. 
the Gospels all begin by saying God has come to us in Christ and done what we have failed to do. Now, um, for my second point, I want to say there's no one like Jesus. Um, what I mean by this is that people may think that, you know, lots of people are sinless and lots of people, you know, are pretty good. But from the point of view of all the prophets, we're all sinful except for Jesus. So I've got here too, there is no one like Jesus. Jesus is sinless and he's the source of our salvation. So we've got a reference, uh, a couple of references here. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, this is quite different to Muhammad. And so this is where I want to say that Jesus is not like Muhammad. Uh, in the Quran, it says, Know, Muhammad, that there is no God but Allah, and seek forgiveness for your sin and for the sin of believers, men and women. And so Muhammad was commanded uh, in the Quran to seek forgiveness for his sins, whereas the gospel declares that Jesus has no sin and that, that he, did, he did that for us. Um, I think another thing that makes Jesus different is that he knew what would happen to him while Muhammad didn't. So uh, I've got two references here. One is when Muhammad was at a funeral and it said Allah's apostle was at a funeral. And he said, as for him, that is the man who is dead, by Allah, death has come to him. By Allah, I wish him all good. By Allah, in spite of the fact that I am Allah's apostle, I do not know what Allah will do to me. And uh, this seems to be based from this verse in the Quran. Say, I am not something new among the messengers. And I do not know what will be done to, with me or with you. I only follow what is revealed to me. I am only a warner. But Jesus is very different to this. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. Uh, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So he knows exactly what's going to happen. And in John's gospel, we read, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. So you see, Jesus has the control of God in his own life and death in that sense. Um, and so there is no one like Jesus. And this is what God said he would do through the prophets. They're my two reasons. Uh, to, to believe the Christian position because there's no one like Jesus and what Jesus is doing um, is what God said in the prophets he would do. So I'll just finish up now. I want to thank you for your attention. I hope this information has been helpful to you to understand why Christians believe what they do. And I look forward to hearing from Abdullah to uh, hear what he's got to say and, and what he's got to say about what I've just said there. Thank you very much. Great, thank you for that, Sam. Um, and we will now meet Abdullah. Um, Abdullah, I have the same two introductory questions for you, so you've had a little bit more time to think about them, maybe. But what is your favourite children's book and or movie? My favourite children's book? Um, I have a 21-month-old son, and there's this one book uh, that's titled... It's not a famous one. I think my wife just bought it for him. Um, uh, my Daddy Loves Me, so... Oh. And it says, and on every page, it's, it has an example and says, my daddy loves me. I know he does. And it just keeps going like that. And, I, and my son loves it too. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm, I'm sure his dad loves it as much as the son does. <laughs> um, and, um, and what's one thing in your life that you would have loved? that you would love to accomplish during your lifetime? Actually, I think um, I'm, I'm on the same page with Samuel here, actually. Um, uh, I've started and stopped my Arabic studies uh, many times. And so uh, um, I've renewed my passion and I'll get back to it uh, in a couple of months. Uh, that's my plan. So I'm uh, memorizing the Quran, um, uh, being able to speak Arabic, classical Arabic fluently. Um, and of course, uh, See, uh, you know, uh, seeking salvation, I think, if I might say. <laughs> Great. I love it. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, yeah, so you'll have now 15 minutes for your initial presentation. Uh, anyway, beautiful. Uh, big thank you to the Christian Union and the uh, Beacon University Islamic Society there in Geelong. Um, and of course, Samuel Green, and good to see everyone again. Um, uh, that's my details. That's the program we're on today. 
And if you have any questions, you want to get in touch, please do so. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, not on TikTok. Um, but, you know, if you're there, uh, probably, hopefully you don't find me there. So let's begin the program, right? Let's begin on my side. So why are we saved? Now, this is such a, uh, on how are we saved, in fact, right? This is such a fundamental question. And it's sort of, it's not one of those, unfortunately, it's not one of those sexy questions, but it's so important. This is the whole point of uh, knowing who God is, the whole point of religion uh, and uh, the path that we take and the guidance comes back down to this question. Because we uh, fundamentally, this is what we're here for. We're here to know who God is, know who, how to worship God, and, in, and uh, through that, um, uh, seek the correct path. And that's, that's a, 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 our hereafter depends on this particular topic. That's why, that's, that's why it's so, so important. And so in many ways, this is an urgent topic to uh, think about, to consider, and to answer uh, in the most correct way possible. Now, I want to take a particular approach because, uh, you know, I want to take a sort of a, a grassroots sort of first principle approach because, of course, when we're having these conversations between uh, Muslims and Christians, there's a lot that's assumed in this conversation. And I want to strip away all of that. Um, because anybody who, and I, and I sincerely say this for both Muslims and Christians, um, to uh, seek to understand this from the first principle. Otherwise, you assume things and, and certain things lead to other things. So, for example, we know who God is. And, of course, we had a conversation um, uh, last semester, knowing who God is, knowing what scripture is from God. And then, of course, only God can tell us how to seek found for salvation, right? Um, without instruction from uh, our creator, um, uh, this is sort of a guessing game and we'll never, never know. Right, and so it's really important for us to investigate those questions. I know this is not the this is not the topic of tonight's discussion, so I won't I won't I won't go through it uh, in that to that extent. But it's something that we need to understand before we can encounter this question. This question is not one that we answer first. This is a question that this is a question that comes later. So we have to firstly understand who God is, then who, uh, and then He's uh, how and who He's revealed Himself through. So scripture and whatnot. And if we don't, if we don't do that, um, we're sort of jumping the gun and we're talking past each other, and we're not. We're not uh, taking this question sincerely. So in Islam, the and of course I'll, I'll, I'll discuss with, um, I'll engage with Samuel's points. But in Islam, it's simple. Salvation is very very simple. Um, uh, Islam teaches us that that God, um, uh, that mankind, uh, has created been created in a in a in a in a pure state. Our babies, our kids, my child, my son, he's he's unaccountable for his he's, he can't commit sins. He's born in purity. He's born in with guidance and whatnot. Right, and so mankind is born in this state, um, and and so Islam teaches that uh, God created man with the best uh, best of states. Yeah, you know, we created man in the finer state in chapter uh, ninety five uh, verse four. Nevertheless, mankind is prone to making mistakes because we are f uh, fundamentally fa fallible beings, and so this is an inev inevitable consequence uh, of the free will that God has gifted us. Um, and when God created man, He did not expect us to be angels. For he had countless angels, perfect in their compliance. And of course, uh, in the creation of Adam, God brought into existence something different, a creature with free will. And, his, and this is the submission through submission to the creator through out of our own choice. And a consequence is that, you know, we commit sins. We make mistakes. We have shortcomings. And God knew that we will fall into sin even before he created us. God is all knowing. And so in Islam, it is uh, up to every human being to to take responsibility of their own actions. And so, uh, you know, so long as they're of the correct age and a sound mind, um, in the Quran, it tells us very clearly, whoever accepts guidance does so for his own good. And whoever strays does so for his own peril. Um, so no soul will bear the burden of another. And not having the safety blanket or, uh, of another person carrying out sins means that Muslims have to strive in, uh, in bettering themselves from the cradle to the grave. And so in turn, making a believer a force for good in society. In Islam, two of the names of God, Al-Wudud and Ar-Rahim. Al-Wudud, the, the most loving, and Ar-Rahim, the most merciful. These attributes manifest themselves um, uh, in God's gratitude or at God's attitude towards uh, sins. So God, for example, tells us in uh, chapter 39, verse 53, O oh, servants who are transgressed against, my, against their souls, despair not the mercy of God. Verily, God forgives all sins. He is oft forgiving, yeah, and he's most merciful, right? And so God sees sins as, as we, uh, that we commit, but he waits for us to repent, and we do so. He forgives us. And this is part of how that, uh, of God's love. The repentance, it's, a vol it's voluntary in return. And the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was reported to have said, God turns with mercy to him who turns uh, to him in repentance. 
Yeah. So in Islam, God's love and, and mercy transcends all other types of love and mercy. His love and mercy is greater than anything in, the, in, in this world and any form. And it's not, in, it's not comparable to any human form of love and mercy. Even the mother, the, the love between a mother and, and, and a child. He doesn't need anything. God does not need anything. Um, a, a mother's love and mercy, for example, is, is although it's selfless, it's based on an internal need for love and child, uh, for a child. And so it's, it's, it's required and it completes her. Yeah. So this is totally different. The love and mercy of, uh, from, your, from, the, from the creator is incomparable to anything in this, in this world. And so to contrast this, this is, the Islamic conception is very simple. Um, uh, accept, the, accept and understand the, the, the message of Islam, that there's only one God worthy of worship and Muhammad is a, his last and final messenger, to recognize the messengers and the prophets before him, um, act upon that um, and repent. That's that, as simple as that. Now, um, I'll engage with some of the points Samuel did in the, in the rebuttal, but I won't for now just because we're, the time is ticking. So the point here is, is there's a bit of a dilemma and, I'll, and I'll, I'll unpack that, yeah? When we contrast this to the Christian understanding, now Samuel had a very, very, um, uh, you know, went, went through it very quickly, but of course, uh, I think he represented it, of course he's in the position to represent it, uh, is that more or less uh, that you know, sin is like a debt and a debt that must be repaid. And so God can't simply just forgive sin. Uh, according to the Christian uh, New Testament understanding, is that you know for the wages of sin is death. For example, in, uh, in one of Paul's letters in the Romans, um, and that's what he said in uh, chapter six, verse twenty-three. And so God is portrayed as being uh, whose mercy is contingent upon the shedding of blood. Yeah, and the church, church teaches that uh, this is what Jesus um, has was sent down to die on the cross. His sin, his sinless life represents the ultimate sacrifice to appease God's wrath and wash away the sins of the entire of humanity. Yeah, and, rec- and the, this way he reconciles it with God. Yeah, and the theology, this is the theology that underpins the crucif- crucifixion. Um, and of course, this is, a, this, is a, this is something that needs to be investigated, but for this conversation, we'll take it for granted. Yeah, and this is the theology that underpins. And I think um, Samuel represented that quite well. And so I won't go through, you know, many of the references are from the letters of Paul. And I want to keep, I want you to keep note of that, and I want us to and I'll, and I'll, and I'll ask questions why why that's the case, right? Um, many of these references are from the letters of Paul, and, and Paul is Paul is introducing this uh, theodicy or uh, theology, yeah. And so uh, this blood atonement uh, essentially uh, comprises of God's justice, mercy, and love and mercy. And now let's let's sort of let's unpack that a little bit, right? Um, God's love for mankind lies at the heart of the gospel message. Yeah? In John 3, 16, it says, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only, his only son and whoever believes in him uh, shall, um, shall not perish and have eternal life. However, the crucifixion of Jesus would be a gross act of injustice on the part of God. In the Christian theology, God effectively demonstrates his love by torturing his son. Yeah? Such a system of justice is one that uh, we human beings ourselves wouldn't even use in everyday practical settings. So suppose, uh, you know, suppose one day um, a, a judge throws you in prison for an apparent, for any, for, for no apparent reason. And so then when he questions your arrest and your imprisonment, the judge says that although he knows you're innocent, he decides to punish you as a statutory or substitutionary atonement for the crimes of another who had been, uh, who had now been set free. Now, would you accept the judge's ruling? Well, no one would accept that such a situation. We would all protest and ask ourselves, why is this being, why are we being punished? Because we're innocent. And so such a system is not just. Yeah? If anyone is to be punished, punished, the one who is guilty should be, uh, the guilty party should be the one. And so even a human court that, uh, that punishes an innocent person in place of the guilty would be considered as a corrupt. Yeah? It would be a miscarriage of justice. How, would, how, how much more unjust or unjust would it be that if God was behind such a system? And yet such a system is exactly what the Christian theology of the blood atonement um, represents. And furthermore, if God always requires a blood sacrifice in order to forgive, then the question is, needs to be asked is whether God really actually forgives. Imagine if someone punched you in the face yeah, and gave you a bloody nose. And you, so you have two options. In the spirit uh, uh, of an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, you could punch them back and that would be a justice. Or you could just forgive them. Both of these options are valid in Islam. But what is not logical is that if you punch someone else and say, now I forgive you. Yeah? That's not forgiveness because you took your revenge. In a similar way, the Christian portrayal of God is one of getting his blood payment, his ransom, and only then he's, he's able to let you go. So we can see that with the crucifixion, forget, forgiveness is not being fulfilled by God. But by comparison, the Quran's concept of divine justice and forgiveness is natural. God can forgive 
our transgressions without blood atonement. And all we have to do is ask upon him. Yeah, we have to sincerely repent. No one has to die. No one has no blood has to be spilt. God doesn't require blood to forgive. He can simply forgive. He doesn't, he, just as he can forgive, uh, just as we can forgive each other. Uh, and and we're, we're mere mortals. And so shouldn't God, the creator uh, of the love and mercy that exists among his creation, be even more capable of, love and, uh, of, of this love and mercy? The reality is that the concept of, quote unquote, Jesus paid for the price of our sins is an alien creed that is incompatible with God's love and mercy. To claim that mankind was only able to properly access God's forgiveness the moment that Jesus died and shed his blood on the cross uh, is an intolerable, intolerable challenge to the principles of God's love and mercy. So, and we, we now know that the human story is so old. It goes back tens and thousands of years, hundreds of years, hundreds of thousands of years. And to say it's only been 2000 years since a proper relationship between man and God has been made possible. This is, this is sort of a bit of a mockery of the idea of divine love. And because that is, and, and I, I, I believe that it's not loving. A God who coherently shows his mercy, compassion, and forgiveness for his creation doesn't uh, stuff all of salvation into one single moment in human history. And this is at the time of the crucifixion. And so in the Quran, the Quranic vision is totally different. In, in chapter 13, verse 7, uh, quite, it says, for every, for every people has been a guide. God sends uh, salvation. God sends uh, messengers uh, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, you know, prophets to mankind. Now, the dilemma, is, the, the, the dilemma is this. If Jesus is God and the crucifixion then effectively um, amounts to God incarnating himself into creation and committing suicide in order to forgive the sinners, uh, the sinners um, from himself. So according to Christianity, God can only forgive sin if he punishes himself first, even though he is the one whom the sin has been committed against. So imagine if someone wronged you just again, yeah? If you, if you follow this doctrine, the only way you can forgive a person is, for example, if you punish someone, uh, punish yourself first. Right? And I want us to really consider how much sense does this make? But let's take a step back from this. Yeah, There's a rational sort of philosophical argument from there. And then there's sort of, does blood atonement have a foundation in the Bible to begin with? Um, now, I'm running out of time, so I won't, go, I, won't go, I won't be able to comment on all of this. But here's a, here's a beautiful example. Yeah? Here's a beautiful example from um, uh, the Old Testament, 1 Kings uh, chapter 8, verses 46 and 50. Yeah? And this is the entire passage, uh, uh, um, this entire passage, uh, let's read it. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. When they sin against you, if there is, if there, uh, um, when they sin against you, um, uh, for there is no one who does not sin, and you, uh, and you become angry with them and forgive them with over their enemies, who take them captive with their own lands at the at the rear, and if they um, have a change of heart in land where they're held captive and they repent and they plead and 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 uh, um, and, and and therefore, yeah, I'll keep going. Um, I'm looking at the timer, so I'm just trying to read it. But I'll get to the last, the last, the last verse on there. And forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all of your offenses they've committed against you, and call, and cause their captors to show their mercy. Now this is uh, this is a passage uh, that is um, uh, that you know God in the Old Testament is 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 commanding. So think about it. God in the Old Testament is not saying that hey we need to punish somebody else. Hey we need to um, take revenge um, uh, um, uh, from for X Y and Z. Here, the words of Solomon represent a total refutation uh, of the Christian theology of God's forgiveness and uh, being contingent on blood atonement. Now, there's another example I want to bring, yeah? Because Samuel didn't bring anything from the Old Testament. He sort of made a claim, uh, but he didn't bring any evidence from that claim. Sort of very cherry-picked um, uh, in that. And I want to... These are, these are sort of clear... This is not just one verse. It's, it's a passage, yeah? So let's go to the next passage. Um, here we are in Ezekiel. Um, and basically the, basically the same message, yeah? Yeah? The message is that we can we can see God is pleased when people uh, when the guilty people stop sinning and they make sincere repentance, yeah. And so, uh, do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? Declares the Sovereign Lord. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn away from their ways and they and uh, and and live? Yeah. This is the this is the same as the Islamic understanding. The Islamic understanding is is that you have you you stop committing your sins and you come you come to sincere repentance uh, and turn to God. And in doing so, you have total access to God's mercy uh, and God's pleasure. And here's another example here. Um, I'll quickly run through it because time is running short in, in Jonah. Um, and here an entire nation, over 120,000 people condemned to destruction were forgiven by God uh, um, when they simply repented and fasted without any offering of sacrifice. Right. I'll keep going a little bit just because there's a few more points and you can subtract that time, I guess. 
Um, my thing is not working. Come on, turn. Yeah, cool. And then there's a perfect. Yeah, this is a beautiful. This is a beautiful passage. What is what does Jesus himself say about this? Because Samuel never never actually uh, quoted anything from Jesus himself. He quoted from Paul. He quoted um, uh, from Acts. He didn't quote from uh, a disciple. He didn't quote from Jesus' own mouth. And this is a beautiful example. Yeah, in this passage in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 9 to 15. And I'll get to the bottom just because that's where the take-home message is. For if you, forgive your other, if, you, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Yeah, no, no blood sacrifice there. Just forgive them. Yeah, but if you do not forgive other, other sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is, the, this is allegedly the words of Jesus himself. Yeah, and I'll keep going. Uh, come on, this thing. Um, and of course, there's, there's other examples as well. And um, it's all from the uh, from the old. Uh, so we've got Luke here, a passage from Luke. Um, I won't be able to read through it there, but I'm sure um, someone can bring it up and we can discuss this a little bit better. But the, the take home message is that today salvation has come to the house because this man too, the son of Abraham, and they've but basically they, all they've done is ask for forgiveness. Yeah. Um, he's been a sinner. He, he repented to his Lord and he was forgiven. And these are clear examples in the New Testament. These are from the synoptic, these are from uh, the synoptic tradition. Um, and I'll leave it up there, inshallah. So I'm, uh, I know I've got a couple of minutes subtracted there and I'll come back. But my, the, the, me the message I'm bringing here is that, um, to conclude, is that the message of, the message of God uh, and the forgiveness of God has been consistent throughout all times and different places. Yeah, the Jewish understanding of uh, salvation is very, very similar to the Islamic understanding, and it's a continuation of that. The Pauline understanding of salvation introduced by Pauline Christianity um, uh, is, is a, has departed from that. What it sought to do was reconcile um, uh, the pagan uh, understandings of salvation at the time, pagan offerings, and it reconciled that with uh, uh, and introduced it in, into Christianity from there. So um, God is all merciful. Everyone has access to God. Everybody, all, all you have to do is recognize who God is, seek God's repentance sincerely, and you have it. You don't have to, you don't have to rely on anything, um, or anything else um, is directly accessible to you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, we're going to have a quick break, very quick, only one minute, just to let that settle in um, to give both of our speakers a chance um to yeah work out their replies um to the others presentation um because that's the segment that's coming up next yeah just, sorry just start with oh, all right um i'll be quick uh um just to respond in to some of samuel's contentions is that uh, the path to salvation is the same for everyone right in the islamic understanding um there's levels of paradise so the levels of reward that people can achieve um, uh, and so, for example, you know, uh, some people, uh, you know, certain virtuous acts are rewarded in different ways, and so they're given concessions. But the pathway to paradise is is the same. So, um, sort of Samuel sort of complicating it is not something that's uh, explained in the Islamic tradition. Uh, what it's explained, the way it's represented, is that to accept the message of Islam, to do good actions, and then rely on the mercy of God. And so, the mercy of God can come through many means, um, uh, but the one you must fundamentally repent. Um, to God in order to access that. Now, one one point was made that the Prophet Muhammad um, was asking for forg for forgiveness because he sinned and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I'm not sure where Samuel got that from. In the Islamic tradition, the understanding of prophets and messengers are that they do not commit sins. The Prophet Muhammad is the example for mankind in the Islamic understanding, and by being the example for mankind, he is showing mankind how to repent. And he misquoted uh, one of those verses as well as for the translation of 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 um uh, which one was it um was verse, uh, Quran verses 47, chapter 47, uh, verse 19. Um, and the translation was, uh, was in, uh, translation implied that uh, Muhammad was seeking forgiveness for his sins. And that's not what it says. Um, so if you go open it up on any, um, on any other uh, platform, there's many translators and you, you understand that there's a little bit more to that verse uh, than that. Um, uh, the other point here is, is that if, if, um, if God did, um, there's implications here. And so this concept of salvation in the Christian tradition is a bit more complicated than, than it's presented. You know, you have entire Christian denominations that, that fought and killed other people because of this, right? You have, um, you've got all the way from, uh, you know, you've got from the Catholic tradition and understanding of salvation, um, uh, you know, things to do with, uh, and then you've got from the Protestant tradition and everything in between. You've got things about under, uh, faith alone, ideas of baptism, you know, even predestination in the Calvinist tradition. So it's a bit more of a complicated, um, uh, you know, point here. It's not, it's not as simple as it's been presented. 
Um, also, the point here is, is in the Jew Jewish tradition, uh, Jesus being a Jew and upholding the law, this idea of a blood sacrifice atonement for the fund for the sins of others does not exist. Um, so he could not could not have could not have possibly been a continuation of the previous prophets and messengers. You just go simply ask an Orthodox Jew. Um, uh, this concept is totally foreign, um, and you'll see that it's been introduced by the Pauline understanding. All the references are from Paul um, when it comes to this, and Paul sort of has a uh, has a, a very big difference of opinion with James here. So, and of course, you've got to reconcile this with the the Old Testament, which you cannot do. Um, so. I'll leave it there and I'll, I'll continue when I have another chance. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Abdullah. Um, Sam, over to you whenever you're ready. Thank you for that, Abdullah. Um, you were saying that in Islam, people are born pure and uh, that the Islamic understanding, and, and that is the case. I, I agree with that. I would just say that there's no evidence for that in, in practice. I know it might be a theory, but in practice, your children need to be brought back. So I just don't see any evidence for that at all. I don't see any evidence at all for God sending prophets to, to all the nations of the world. Um, that's just historically doesn't happen. Um, you were saying that you just repent and Allah accepts it. Well, no, you don't. As I tried to show in my presentation, you actually need to earn his mercy and to not talk about the martyrs. The martyrs are the one people who get direct straight access to paradise the others don't um, they just don't they they go there later on so to not include the the assurance of salvation that martyrs have i think you know you're not really telling us uh what what islam believes now i'll look at the issues that you raised about christianity you said that the idea of blood sacrifice is from paul and not jewish i want to say have you read the bible the whole Torah is based around God saving a people out of Egypt, making a tabernacle, and in that tabernacle, God dwells. And if you want to approach God, you have to sacrifice a sacrifice of atonement for forgiveness to, to approach God. And this is precisely what Jews believe. It's not Pauline at all. I mean, Paul teaches it because he's Jewish. And Jesus teaches it on, uh, on, the, Lord's, uh, on, the, uh, um, on the Passover meal. But the idea of a Passover, the idea of a sacrifice for sin to bring you into the uh, presence of God is there in, in the law of Moses. There's a whole book on it called Leviticus. So almost a whole book on sacrifices of atonement. So you're just completely wrong there um, because it's a major teaching. It's a major Christian Jewish teaching. The reason why it's not in the Quran is that 500 years after Muhammad was born, sorry, 500 years before Muhammad was born, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And the Hadith tells us that Muhammad copied the Christians and the Jews around him. And so he didn't see any of those practices of the temple. So he didn't learn about God's presence in the temple. He didn't learn about priests who stand between you and a holy God. And he didn't learn about sacrifices of atonement. And so um, it, it's this structure that is behind the prayer of Solomon. You referred to 1 Kings uh, chapter 8 where Solomon's prayer and Solomon says to repent, but he's saying repent and turn back to the, the temple that he built where the sacrifices of atonement were being offered. Okay, so you, you can't take Israel out of their covenant to God and their covenant to God is outlined in the law of Moses and it's all around blood sacrifice to come into God's presence. It's the same with Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, yes, it says repent, but read uh, the chapter uh, two chapters before Ezekiel, it talks about God coming to make atonement. Read after in Ezekiel, and it talks about in the future, there's going to be great atonement that God will bring through his Messiah King. And so, um, yes, you have to repent, but that doesn't say that that doesn't mean that God doesn't want a sacrifice of atonement as well. We have to let God determine for, for us how we approach him. And in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, and the gospel, Blood sacrifice is just what's there. And as Christians, we just accept what the prophets say. It's the same with Jonah. Like with, with, the, with the Ninevites, they could they had forgiveness because of the ministry of Israel, which Ezekiel, which uh, Exodus 19 says Israel is a, a priestly nation. And Israel has that priestly role bringing the nations into God's presence. If the Ninevites wanted to come into God's presence, 
they would have had to offer up a sacrifice of atonement in the temple of Jerusalem. The main problem here is that Muhammad hasn't taught Muslims that, uh, any doctrines of the temple. Um, what have we got? I've got one minute left. Now, you said um, uh, that God tortures his son and how, you know, this is just God torturing God and it doesn't make any sense. It makes perfect sense. It's the divine son taking to himself a human nature and doing what humanity has failed to do. God just doesn't throw humanity out. God says, I made you to bring me glory and you will bring me glory and I will make you, I, I will fulfill your destiny myself. And so um, not all men are the same. Adam represented all of humanity. Uh, the prime minister of a country represents the whole of that country. And that's who Jesus is. You know, saying that if someone hits somebody else, why don't you just forgive them? That doesn't even work because Jesus, Adam, prime ministers, leaders, representatives of countries have a unique representative role for the whole country. And that's why what Jesus did, he did for all of God's people. I'll finish there. Great. Thank you, Sam. Um, we'll now move on to a time of cross-examination um, where each speaker will be able to ask questions of the other. Um, this is another five-minute um, segment, and we'll start with you, Abdullah. Cool. Um, first question is, is uh, Samuel, can you provide a reference for uh, Jesus um, uh, uh, claiming this? Uh, evidence from, from Jesus himself um, that blood sacrifice is the only way to... Uh, blood yeah. sacrifice of himself uh, is the only way to... Um, uh, to get salvation. Yes, so um, thank you for that question. Uh, it's excellent. So uh, that would be Jesus at the Passover meal. Let me just uh, quickly find it here for you. Jesus at the Passover meal, trying to. Um, um, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and said to his disciples, Take and eat this. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So that's, you know, it, it's certainly there. Um, yeah, and I could could give others. Okay. Um, can you, uh, could you also show how, um, uh, question. Um, hold on. Can you show how the uh, Jews of the Old Testament and uh, uh, foretold that God Himself is going to come incarnate and sacrifice His Son? Um, uh, uh, can you show me evidence from that from the Old Testament? Yeah, well, what I showed was because that's um, that's the prophecy. That's the that's what you're appealing to. You're appealing to the Old Testament. That's 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 yeah. that's mentioned. So what I showed was um, Isaiah 59, first of all, where God says He looked, and there's no human that can do it. Okay. Okay, so that was one of the references I gave. Isaiah 59, sorry, I, I can't... I, That's okay, so I'll, I'll follow up with another question. So yeah. why did why did Jews hold a different understanding to the Christian understanding of uh, of, of blood sacrifice? Uh, well, I'd say they... Uh, well, I, I would say it depends on the Jew that you speak to. So what's happened is when the temple... Since the temple's been destroyed for so long, Judaism as it's practiced is rabbinic judaism it's not temple judaism so when you read about moses in the old testament when you read about jesus they're all temple jews they're going up to the temple the temple is the place of the presence of god and there's the the blood sacrifice of atonement to come into god's presence and that's just what god ordains um, now jews today they obviously don't have a temple so they don't. They can't do that, and so it's not part of their religion or part of their practice. But if you go and speak to, um, you know, a, a rabbi, he will absolutely know about this. That they've tried to work out ways to get around it, but you know, you get someone like, you know, you, you, your rabbis. They want the temple rebuilt so that they can go back to do it. Um, another question: um, Could God just simply forgive? Is that is that possible for God? Um, in one sense, God does what God does, and God. So the question, no, Samuel, let's, 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 the question is, could God just forgive? Is no, that, is that, is no, a simple no, answer. The, to that, yeah. You're asking a question, and I'm saying God has chosen to do something different. So I'm, I don't want to speculate. What I'm saying is that God chooses how we approach Him. It's not up to me to say, well, I think I should approach God no, this way. 
I'm just saying God, God sets out. And in the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, the gospel, we, are, we come into his presence. It's not just forgiveness. It's coming into the presence of God through a blood sacrifice. That's, that's just what we see. Okay, but it's, it's possible for God to, to just forgive sins. Um, from what I see in scripture, no, because God had... God including the, so the, example, the examples I've presented before, including the one from, I think it was Matthew, uh, that, uh, you know, Jesus, Jesus said that himself. Um, uh, so no, also, God, but, but, but they're not examples. All the ones you've spoken about were said by people who were in a covenant with God where they knew that they had to offer up those sacrifices. So all the sacrifices... So, so Matthew of chapter 6... Prayer, so Matthew chapter six verse nine to fifteen, where but he he, as he says very directly, allegedly. Um, but if you uh, that you know you seek repentance and you and you get forgiven by the Father, yeah. that's not you don't uh, agree with uh, that. No, no, of, of course I agree with it. But what I'm saying is, when you read the whole of Matthew, Jesus also says the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And as I just read on the um, at the the Passover meal, He says my blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. And so the idea is if God has forgiven you in, in what he's done in Christ, you have to forgive others. So we've got, we've got to read the whole book. That's all I'm saying. You've got to read the whole book. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, with some good questions. Uh, Sam, you'll now have five minutes to ask um, Abdullah some questions and Abdullah, you'll have a chance to respond. Okay, Ab Abdullah, um, I put up some hadiths where, where people could go on pilgrimage on behalf of somebody else. And, um, and so it seems to me that while Muslims say one person can't do something for someone else, when I actually go and read the Islamic sources, I see that people can do things for other people. And I just wanted to get your... Uh, yeah, you know, so um, I think, I think this, uh, what applies is what you said before. You have to read the whole thing. Um, so uh, we in the, in the Islamic tradition, we don't look at one verse in isolation of others uh, or one hadith in isolation of others either. Um, there's details, there's exceptions, and that's how the jurisprudence works. Um, that doesn't change the mode of salvation. Salvation is through the mercy of God. Um, uh, and so um, these are sort of pathways where people can, um, can potentially make up for their core obligations. Um, and it's uh, up to the mercy of God to accept or reject them. Um, and so the salvation doesn't change, um, sort of uh, detailed pathway, may, uh, that sort of more details, but uh, the concept of salvation Islam stays coherent in that respect. Yeah, and, and I guess I'd want to agree with that, but all I'm saying is one person does it for another. So I've got a Muslim friend from Melbourne who went on pilgrimage for his mother, yeah. and his good work has now been credited to his mother. And I'm just yeah. saying that's actually a similar idea to Christianity, where the good work of Jesus is credited to us. I think that's a bit of a stretch. Um, that's a big stretch um, to attribute that to similar to Christianity. Exactly. We're talking. We're talking about an you know, entire sacrifice of potentially God's Son mm -hmm. Himself, so God Himself being incarnate on on mankind. That's. A, I don't think that's similar in any respect. Um, uh, but yeah, um, up to you to um, agree or disagree. I guess. Now, can you talk about martyrs and what special place martyrs have in, in all this? Because in the Quran, from my reading, they do seem to be the ones who go directly, uh, they directly gathered up to be with God, while others, uh, or most aren't. Can you just sort of... So just like, just like us? anyone, just like anyone, uh, people's actions are judged by their intentions and obviously following that up with the correct action and the correct belief. Um, martyrdom is just one of those pathways. And so certain... Uh, things are more virtuous uh, certain actions are more virtuous than others um, that's just one of them um, another one is for example if somebody uh, you know passes away in the path of knowledge for example you know they're considered a martyr so ma martyrdom is not just you know on the battlefield quote unquote um, it's sacrificing for the cause of God for the sake of God um, uh, and there's many many pathways for um, uh, for you know sort of uh, an accelerated path only because those actions are considered uh, more virtuous. So um, the path of salvation is still the same. Uh, and they still have to um, have, you know, understand the message of Islam, um, uh, follow that with correct actions, and also um, seek repentance. So um, uh, in, in doing that, uh, that's subject to God accept accepting that. And that's uh, the same for, any, for anyone's life. It's just a particular, very special 
um, uh, situation or a very special circumstance for that reason. All right, thank you. Um, now, you said that I misquoted, um, I believe it was uh, Surah 47 verse 19, but I was talking about Muhammad sinning. Um, now, you were saying that um, Muslims believe the prophets are sinless, but from my reading of Islamic theology, that's the type of belief that develops in later centuries. And I'll just read this out. This is from the study Bible. I mean, the study Quran, you can see it there. Uh, it's done by Muslims. And it says, know then that there is no God but Allah and ask forgiveness for your sin and for the believing men and women. Um, God knows uh, your comings and your goings and your abode. Now, it, it seems to be saying that Muhammad needs to confess his sins. Right. I mean, it, I mean, I'm happy for people to look at, it, but it's chapter 47, verse 19, and it makes a distinction between Muhammad and the other believers and says, um, you know, confess your sin. So I'm, I'm not convinced I've misquoted anything. Yeah. So um, uh, it's uh, if, OK. If, uh, if you potentially have a misquoted, but you've taken a very, very poor translation um, uh, and that's probably displays uh, a lack of access to the Arabic language. And because of that, um, you don't you, you won't be able to um, discern um, possessive nouns uh, and uh, and whatnot uh, in the in the verse. So the verse does not mention that. Um, in fact, in Islamic uh, in Islamic uh, in, the, in the study of belief, this is actually a really core cool concept. Um, so uh, you haven't exactly found a very um, the whole idea that uh, prophets and messengers are, are sinless. Um, but they can make mistakes, but they're not classified as sins. Um, and so they're examples for mankind. And because they're examples for the mankind, mankind needs to repent. Um, and of course, they're going to display that to the utmost um, amount possible. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that, guys. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is a combined DUIS and GCU event. Um, and now both clubs are going to have a couple of minutes. Uh, just to talk about who their club are, uh, who they are, um, who their club is and what they do. Um, and so first I'd like to invite Rona up um, to tell us a little bit about Duis. Thanks, Rona. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, yeah, it's great to see people attending. Um, so for Duis, do I share my screen or like a PowerPoint or? Nah? Yeah, if you want to, go for it. Yeah. Okay, um, so if you attended the last discussion that we had back in November, you probably know a bit about us, uh, but our the aim of DUIS or Deakin University Islamic Society is to create a safe space for Muslims and uh, not only that, but to uh, give non-Muslims the opportunity to be able to uh, get to know Muslims and um, yeah, we run events uh, open for everyone and uh, yeah, non-Muslims are more than welcome to come and just get to know more about us. Uh, and yeah, uh, so with the Ramadan popping up, we do have a couple of planned events, uh, but generally we do have like trivia nights, um, collaborations, Islamic lectures, uh, barbecue nights, henna nights and things like that. Um, a sneak peek into some of the events we're planning on having um, in the next month uh, to keep on, like keep an eye out on our uh, social media. But we're planning on um, for every week of Ramadan, we're hoping to have uh, an event every week and just keep it exciting and hopefully keep everyone engaged during Ramadan. Um, and it's not just for uh, Muslims; it's open to the non-Muslims too. You don't have to be Muslim to attend. Um, yeah, and it would be great to see some of you there. Thank you. These are our socials. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thanks so much for that, Rona. Um, now we're going to cross over to Dan from the GCU. Um, tell us a bit about who they are. Cool. Thanks, Jed. Um, yeah, it's good to see so many people coming along. Um, yeah, great to see everyone getting involved today. Um, so, yeah, just briefly about the Geelong Christian Union. Um, we're a group of people who like to um, meet up during the week, um, hang out in groups and just explore the Bible um, and learn about, yeah, 
Jesus's life here on earth. Um, so our slogan is stand firm and reaching out together. Um, so the stand firm refers to, yeah, meeting throughout the week um, and just encouraging each other in our faith and, and reading the Bible. Um, and then the reaching out together um, refers to, yeah, I guess inviting our friends and, and those people around us to, yeah, come and be involved in the Christian union and find out who Jesus is for themselves. Um, so just a couple of quick announcements about some events we've got coming up. Um, so this Thursday, um, we've got a special Easter Connect group happening. Um, so there's going to be a bit of a talk um, around the theme of Easter. Um, there's also going to be free dinner for all those who come along. Um, it would be great if, um, yeah, any of you here on the Zoom would like to join us for that. Um, it's going to be between 6 and 7.30 on Thursday night. Um, it's at City on Hill Church, which is in East Geelong. Um, there's more information on our Facebook page um, if you need it. And then the next big event that we've got coming up that we'd love to see you guys along at is called Food for Thought. And it's happening in week seven. Uh, the basic idea of Food for Thought is we'll meet together, um, usually at a restaurant. Um, we'll have a bit of dinner together and a bit of dialogue as well about um, the big questions in life. Um, yeah. Uh, everyone's welcome to come along to that um, and share your opinion. Um, it's an open space. Um, we've had lots of people come along in the past, people of all sorts of faiths. We've had atheists, Muslims, Christians, and yeah, people who don't identify with the faith at all. Um, so we'd love to have you come along um, and share a meal with us. Cool. If you want any more info on the Christian Union, you can check out our Facebook page. Um, or we've got a website as well, www.geelong.cu.org.au. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dan. Um, and thank you both. And to, um, yeah, just to both clubs for collaborating and putting on this event. Um, it's very cool. But we're running a bit tight on time, so we're going to have 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and I will throw it over to Caitlin, who will be our moderator for this section. Um, and she's going to, yeah, start with asking some questions. Thanks, Caitlin. All right. Thanks, Jed. Um, we've got some questions rolling in now so if you have any more questions or if any more pop up please feel free to add them to the padlet um but first up we have a couple of questions about how uh about our main question how are we saved so uh to both of you abdullah and samuel what part of salvation do i need to take to be fully assured i will be saved um, I'm happy to go first. Uh, so in Christianity, you can have full assurance that you'll be saved because our salvation is not based upon what we have done, but on what God has done for us in Christ, in Jesus. And so as a Christian, I know that I'm saved because I'm not relying on myself. I'm relying on what God has done for me in, in, in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. Awesome. Thank you. Abdullah? That approach this question, um, I think we should all approach this question from a, uh, from a question of, as a, from a perspective of necessity. And that perspective of necessity is one where we investigate what this question is underpinned by. And what that question is underpinned by is one, uh, identifying the true, understand, true nature of who God is. Um, and then also appreciating um, what revelation is from God. And from there, we're able to um, uh, we're able to appreciate this question and answer it correctly. Um, so, from the Islamic understanding, and, and I believe the Islamic understanding continues from uh, the, the the tradition left by the previous prophets and messengers, uh, is that to recognize and appreciate the existence of the one true God, to worship Him and to repent and turn towards Him, um, and through that. Uh, we qualify for salvation. Mankind is also responsible for their actions. So simply because a certain uh, something happened, it doesn't absolve mankind of certain actions uh, where we commit crimes, where we um, we do you know bad things. We still have to turn and repent to God, and we're held responsible in this life and in the next. Um, so salvation uh, is is immediately important, and I'd encourage everyone to uh, uh, you know um, unpack that a little bit more. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We have a, a kind of follow up question to that. Um, in either religion, do believers receive confirmation of salvation? 
do believers receive confirmation? Um, yes, I would say that in Christianity, the salvation is uh, it's not just about forgiveness. It's about um, it's about God bringing us into His presence through His Spirit, and so. Um, as we come to understand the gospel, we, we grow in our confidence of understanding what God has done for us. And so that, that assurance comes to a confidence in, in, in what God has done for us. And so that's, that's the evidence that I experience in my own life, that I, I read the gospels and I say, this is what Christ has come to do. I can see this is what God's done for me. This is great news. Jesus has died for my sins. He's lived the perfect life. Um, I'm holding on to that. And, you know, Jesus never turned anyone away from him. You know, when when blind people and people who were desperate, who knew that they couldn't save themselves, came to Jesus, he always welcomed them and, and saved them, you know, healed them. And uh, it's the same with us when we come to him with our sins. He, he will never turn us away. And so I, I see his character in the Gospels and know um, that, 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 that I'm saved, that, uh, that, I, that I'm assured. Um, uh, yeah. So, does, well, the question was: Does it, does it confirm? Do we confirm salvation? Is that what it is? Uh, do believers receive confirmation of salvation? Uh, so, from the Islamic understanding, without actual divine instruction, scripture from God, where certain people are, uh, are you know, uh, command from God that this person, X, A, B, C person, is uh, is uh, is quote unquote sent to paradise. Um, all we know as human beings is that we qualify for salvation and God has given us what, what to do in order to qualify for it. So for example, you know, to, and the Christian tradition is actually a little bit more complex than Samuel presented. Uh, Catholics, for example, don't believe that. Um, uh, Calvinists don't, don't believe that. And there's very different shades of, of, uh, pro, uh, of Protestants uh, that have different understandings of, you know, in terms of how baptism is done, whether our sins or our actions actually matter or whether it's faith alone. Um, and even then, um, so from a from a really Calvinist extreme point of view, they might be able to say that hey, God has predestined certain people to go to go to heaven. Um, uh, but the most important thing here is is that does it, does it absolve us of our actions here? So if you if you were to say that the, and this is a really philosophical dilemma, that if God has just you know um, saved us from you know from that and absolved us of all our sins and sacrificed Himself, well then what about people like for example uh, you know Hitler? If Hitler if Hitler took you know, and uh, Hitler was a Christian. And if he took that, um, uh, does that absolve him of his worldly sins? What happens? What happens to people who do bad things to others in this life, despite, uh, you know, Sorry, I, I can answer that. You're talking about Christianity now. So I, I mean, I'm just answering. I'm um, just adding you want to that point. To, yeah, you're welcome. Because you, no, well, you're raising, we were both just sort of meant to talk about our own religions. I mean, I'm happy to start another debate, but um, we, you know, I'm just contrasting the point. Oh, you're welcome to do what you want if you want. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in charge here. <laughs> if you want me to keep it to like that, I can do it. But I thought that adds another dimension. That's to all it. I'm doing. I'm just sort of answering my bit and I'm, I'm sure. not touching on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Shall we move on to the next question then? Yeah. All right. Uh, so question from Abdullah. Uh, how is forgiveness uh, assured in Islam? So and, the only um, thing Oh, Ooh, can I add a little bit to that? Oh, you go for it. Yeah. Um, who decides what sin is and at what age and stage sin is possible for the Muslim? So the only precondition for uh, forgiveness of sin is sincerity. Um, so one has to be sincere uh, and recognize that sin and turn to God. Um, in order to, if in the Islamic understanding, you're, you're only um, uh, responsible for sin at the age of maturity, so the age of puberty. And whatever that age is, and that's determined. That's not hard and fast by any person. Everyone reaches puberty and responsibility, um, uh, you know, uh, subjectively, I guess, in, in a way. Um, but uh, that's all you need to do. Um, you just need, simply need to recognize who God is and turn towards Him. And your uh, your forgiveness, if it's sincere, it is. God tells us uh, in the Quran that is that He would guarantee to accept it. In fact, uh, it goes even further. If you know, if we take a step towards God. Uh, figuratively speaking, if we take a step towards God, God would, you know, take many steps towards us. If, uh, if we were to walk towards God, figuratively speaking, He would run towards us. So, access to access to salvation, access to repentance, and God's mercy is always open for everyone. They just have to turn to Him sincerely. All righty. There's also a bit of a follow-up question to that for Abdullah. Also, yeah. so then, um, if everyone can be saved by Allah, why doesn't everyone go to heaven? Why is there a hell at all? 
Oh, beautiful question. Beautiful question. So um, mankind, uh, in the Islam tells us that mankind has got, uh, has got free will. And so because they have free will, they're responsible for their actions and they're, they're, therefore they're accountable for what they do. Uh, so they're able to choose to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, God is all knowing. So God knows the outcomes of all uh, things, uh, you know, in terms of what, what's going to happen uh, past, present, future and everything. But God does not compel us to do anything. Otherwise, there would be no test uh, in this life. Right. Um, why would why would God, uh, you know, and this is the, uh, this would present a very strong philosophical dilemma and Islamic understanding does not and en get encounter with this because of uh, because of its coherency is that, for example, if God made you do made you commit a sin, why would he punish you? Yeah. Um, so you, mankind has got the option to do and respond uh, accordingly. And for that reason, they're accountable and they're responsible. And so for, at the same time, mankind can turn, choose to turn towards God and ask for repentance and come closer to his creator. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, the outcome of the test of life is either in paradise or in the hell, in hell, um, and uh, where God has given clear instruction for us in the Quran um, in terms of how we can live our life and how we can um, satisfy the mission of, uh, of our purpose of life. And if we do that, um, uh, and we do that sincerely, uh, the outcome is, uh, and, and, you know, he's, he's told us the outcome. Um, so we just need to, we need to strive, uh, we need to continually strive in all aspects of our life and turn to God at all times. Um, and because, you know, uh, we have a, you know, there's a, we, we only have so many heartbeats in this life and we need to make the most of every single one of them. All righty. Thank you for that. Um, so kind of shifting gears a little bit, uh, Samuel. How is Jesus dying on the cross fair or just? How is it uh, fair or just? Well, he is our perfect representative. So as I was saying before, Jesus is not just anyone. Um, Abdullah had said, you know, if, if I hit somebody and then I go and hit somebody else to make up for it, that's not what's happening. That's not what's happening. Um, so uh, in the, in the Bible and certain and to some degree in the Quran, um, Adam is a representative of all of humanity, and what God does with Adam is indicative and, and affects all of humanity. And so Jesus is called the second Adam, and so what he does is not just as some random person, but he is the one who is our perfect representative. Um, and so when he dies, it's us dying, right? Well, what he does, he does on our behalf. And um, because it is God who is doing this for us, it is God working out in his way um, our salvation for us. It is God paying for our sins in a way that he determines. And, um, and so that's, that's the justice. God, God says that we... Um, that, that you can have someone stand in your place if that per person is suitable. And Jesus is being the perfect man, uh, God of ultimate worth. He is in that position. All right. We could do an entire debate on this next question, uh, but someone has written in for both of you. Um, I think this will be our last question. It seems to me that the true method for salvation depends on which historical document, the Bible or the Quran, is best substantiated in regards to historical evidence. Uh, with this in mind, what is the best evidence for either side to believe what is written? Um, that is uh, another, you know, that is a debate um, on its own. Okay, when it comes to the Bible, I, I'll say um, we have um, we have old manuscripts that we can look at, and when we look at those old manuscripts, there's no evidence at all that the message been, has been changed. There's small variants amongst them, but it, it's it's what we've got. It's what we've got. So there's just simply no evidence of any change. We've got old translations, and they testify to what the text was like before, and um, and then we've got early citations. So the New Testament starts getting quoted, or the, the gospel material starts getting quoted from 50 AD. We've got quotes from 50 AD. 
Um, so that's the evidence we've got for the Bible. Um, as I've said, Muslims will often say the Bible's corrupted. There's one perfect Quran. You know, um, I've, as I showed before, there's a whole swag of Qurans if you want to go out there. So I'm actually saying that both of us have got books that we need to work with and we shouldn't go really saying we can just write each other's off. We've just got to look at what we've got and, and that's, what, that's what we've got to work with. Yeah, Abdullah? Yeah, um, fantastic question. Uh, I mean, definitely a debate topic. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I would say is that uh, for, and this is a really important subject for everyone to investigate because essentially our salvation is underpinned by it. And so that on this topic, underneath this topic is this question. And so this question is, is, is really foundational. Uh, what is, what uh, the Quran uh, puts forth is a challenge to mankind. The Quran doesn't tell it to say that, hey, this is the word of God, just accept it and take it for what it is. Not only does Islam have um, uh, the Quranic, uh, have a manuscript tradition, it has also, also oral um, preservation tradition as well. So uh, it, makes a, it makes a challenge to mankind to recreate a chapter or verse like it, as well as other, it makes other, and God um, puts a, a, a covenant on it more or less to say that he will preserve it. So it, it, there's sort of falsification tests that the author of the Quran puts forth. And then through that, we're able to determine whether this book is, a, is, is authored by man or not. Now, similar, to, um, you know, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, certain variants, um, they, that's within the Quranic tradition. Uh, it's, uh, the Quran was preserved in seven different modes, so that's not something special. Um, but this is a quick point that um, because Samuel mentioned, that I'll mention again, uh, is that the Bible tradition is not uh, uniform in that sense. Uh, the different tr Protestant and Catholic traditions have got different canons. Um, so I could easily just pull out, you know, seven, eight different, ten different Bibles. So the question is, which Bible? Um, but I would, I'm really interested in this topic because this is one topic that I'm, I have a very particular interest in sort of history and uh, textual criticism. So um, uh, I think it's a topic, it's a topic actually I debated with, uh, with um, James White when he was in, when he was in Melbourne. Um, so um, but anyway, really good question, and um, I hope everyone takes it seriously and 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 seeks to uh, you know investigate it for themselves. Awesome, thank you both. I think that concludes our Q and A. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Caitlin, and thank you um, to both speakers. Um, we've reached the conclusion of our night, um, and so we're going to uh, yeah give both speakers the chance uh, to sum up their their key points and their key arguments from the night. Um, so they'll have three minutes to do so. Um, and Sam, we'll start with you when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, both societies for organizing tonight. I think it's really, really good that Christians and Muslims can get together and discuss these topics. And, um, and I know that as I engage with Islam, I always have to learn my own faith better. And I find it interesting what I learn about Islam. So um, I, I want to thank the two societies for doing this. I want to thank Abdullah for being part of it and for his contributions tonight. And just to, um, and I want to thank everyone who's, uh, who's been viewing. I hope that you found it helpful and have learned some things and um, got some new questions and some new ideas to pursue in, in some way. And uh, I think that's what we're after, that we want to be making progress as Christians and Muslims. Um, just to review what I said, I, I was saying um, that within Islam, there are different paths of being saved or different ways of earning Allah's mercy. There's the way of the, the martyr who dies on jihad, who goes straight to paradise, other Muslims go into the grave where they where certain things can happen or they may go to hell. As Abdullah pointed out, it's all with Allah's mercy and, and earning it. Yes, but there are those different paths. And I guess as a Muslim, I'd be asking you, you know, do you know which path you're on? And, um, and I'd be wanting to encourage you to, to look at what Christianity says, because um, the Bible is not one book, but it's a collection of many books from many prophets over a 1500 year period. It's got the law of Moses, the books of the prophets, the Psalms, the books of the gospel. And these just have this one unified message about how we approach God and how we've turned away from God. But God has come to do something to save us. 
And as I showed that there's no one like Jesus, Jesus is the only sinless man. Jesus is the one who comes in fulfillment of the prophets. And what he has done is exactly what we need. We need someone to come and save us. Um, we don't actually need instructions on how to try better. Um, we fail. We all fail. We're, we're sinners. We're bound in our sins. We continue to sin. And, um, and I, I think we're fooling ourselves if, if we think that we're not going to continue to sin and that that's a real problem with God. And so God has done something for us. And that's exactly what we need. We need God to do something for us. And that's what he's done in Christ. God has sent his own son to die for our sins, to be raised again, to bring that resurrection life and uh, to bring us into his presence. And that's what you can have. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for that, Sam. Um, over to you for your concluding statement, Abdullah. Um, big thank you again. Uh, resonate Sam's thoughts there. Um, with, uh, thanking the... Oh, what happened there? Um, we're Sam's there. We're thanking the both, both societies as well. Big thank you to Samuel as well uh, as participating in this, and hopefully opens up opportunities for many more conversations around with a dialogue between uh, Muslims and Christians in order for them to represent their own beliefs um, and you know, have uh, really considered and thoughtful uh, conversations around core topics. Um, the things that we have a lot in common in, and the things that we have a lot a lot of differences in, and why and why that's the case. Um, just want to track back to my main contention and my main contention was is really um, highlighting the simplicity uh, of salvation in the Islamic faith um, and that is is that God is all loving and he's all merciful um, and that no sin is too great to be forgiven and the doors of mercy are always open um, uh, uh, and all we have to do is turn to God in sincere repentance with a sincere heart and he, uh, God is capable of washing all our sins with no external frameworks that he has to abide by god is god is sovereign he can do what he can do what he wish wishes and he can forgive anyone in any way that is possible um and uh, uh, i wanted to highlight that this is consistent in the old testament tradition in the torah um and this is something that uh, if you investigate and go to the jewish tradition you'll find that there's a very very clear uh, demarcation between uh, Paul and Christianity and the, con the, uh, the concept of salvation in, in Judaism. Of course, I also want to highlight that this is a continuation of, uh, of the prophetic uh, uh, tradition that God doesn't just simply change his method of salvation, you know, um, you know 10,000 years down the track, um, that this is consistent. I also want to uh, get people to think about the underlying questions here, because this conversation assumes a lot of things, assumes the correct concept of God, it can still, assumes who Jesus is, it assumes the congruence of scripture. And so there's conversations here that need to be had before we have this conversation as well. Um, so I really hope that um, it, uh, uh, this gives you a little bit more thirst uh, to investigate, um, engage with, uh, with both contentions, and really make an assessment for yourself, um, what's more coherent, what's more logical, um, and obviously one that uh, uh, is coherent with God's nature, but also the application of responsibility uh, and accountability. Um, so um, that's the Islamic understanding. Uh, the, doors of, the doors of mercy are always open to anybody. All you have to do is sincerely repent. Um, and that, and uh, that represents who Jesus is, uh, who, what Jesus promoted, uh, and the same uh, ethos that, uh, that Jesus lived by um, in his time. So um, a big thank you to everyone again. Um, and um, you can get in touch with me on Facebook, email, or Instagram, and we can continue the conversation if you have any other questions. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Abdullah. That brings us to the end of our night. Um, we, I just want to, yeah, repeat what these guys have said, um, uh, but back to you. Thank you so much um, to both you, Sam and Abdullah, for coming and for speaking with us. Um, it was, yeah, it's it's really awesome. Um, we, we appreciate the time that you've given up um, and, yeah, to, to present your, uh, yeah, your perspectives on this topic. Uh, um, I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure we all have. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really cool to to be able to tune in and listen. Um, we're all at uni, we're all seeking to learn and trying to find our place in the world. And um, you guys are helping us with that. So thank you very much. Um, I also wanna say, yeah, thanks to everyone from both Duis and the GCU who helped organize this night um, and yeah, helped to sort of get everything set up and rolling. Um, they don't just happen. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of work in the background that goes to 
uh, having an event like this. Um, and so, yeah, to everyone who who helped um, to get things approved through DUSA, to set things up, emails back forward, um, it was, yeah, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, thank you to all of you for coming. Um, it's really great. We, we put these things on, um, hoping that people show up and listen. And um, yeah, really appreciate you guys. I hope that you've all had a great time and heard, um, yeah, that, that you can continue thinking through these big questions of how we're saved. Um, feel free to follow up with, with either Duis or the GCU um, or Sam or Abdullah um, with, with any of us to, um, yeah, if you have more questions um, and are pondering more things, we're all um, really happy to, to have conversations and want to continue that. That's the, sort of the purpose of these nights. We, we want to start the conversation, but we really want to continue them. Um, and yeah, so if you guys are continuing to think through these things, um, definitely get in touch. Um, and like I mentioned before, there's just that feedback form um, that's in the chat. If you can fill that out, we'd really appreciate it um, just quickly. But all in all, really appreciate you all for coming and um, yeah, hope you have a great night.